Our guest tonight is very familiar with Psalm 23. She has indeed walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Join us tonight on Medically Speaking as you hear her incredible story. Welcome to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, your host for the show. You know, this show is sponsored to you for your good health by your county medical society, as well as your county medical foundation. Tonight is a little different. Most of our guests come to us as physicians talking to you about a specific disease that is their expertise. They tell you a little bit about the disease, how they diagnose it, and ultimately what they do to make you better. Well, tonight we bring you a patient, a very, very accomplished lady who has faced her own mortality. Her story is incredible, her bravery is exemplary, and for all of us who struggle with our own mortality or the mortality of others, you're going to find this show very, very interesting. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lisa McDermott. Thank you, Kathy. Lisa, it is just an incredible story. We're going to join you in your life. You graduated valedictorian from your high school. You then went on to college in IUP in um, Indiana University, Pennsylvania, where you got your nursing degree. Again, graduating magna cum laude. And you started to work and then went back to school and got, what, a master's degree in healthcare administration, also graduating magna cum laude. Everything's falling into place. You're married and have a nice 13-year-old daughter and what began to happen? What did you notice? What I noticed is through the course of a year, I started to have blurred vision in my left eye. And it was very subtle. Uh, not anything that I was really concerned about. I really felt that it was something that could have been possibly like a cataract or could have been dry eye. And being a nurse, and sometimes self-diagnosing, uh, I just really thought, you know what, don't make a big deal, you're doing fine, it's really not a big deal. And the next time you go to the eye doctor to get your eyes checked, that's probably what they'll tell you that it is. So you're busy taking care of everybody else, your family, your career, you put off going to the doctor? Yes, I did, which was wrong. And it really could have been much more costly than what it was uh, because I did go to the doctor in the nick of time, but I should have gone sooner and I should have listened to my body and so really paid attention. Where did you start, the eye doctor? I started at the optometrist, yes. I went, I was taking my daughter there for her uh, annual exam in August of 2011. And it had been a year that I had been there and was having the issue with my eye. And I thought I would just go ahead and have my eye appointment the same time with her. So what happened during that appointment? What happened during that appointment is my daughter daughter went in, she had her eyes checked, everything went perfectly for her. She was out picking her frames, they took me back, they checked my eyes, and immediately when they do the testing of each eye individually and they block the vision in the one eye, when they closed my right eye, the, uh, the visual field of that, that my left eye totally went blank. I just, it was like I was seeing darkness. And they were very alarmed. And immediately, so you never realized how bad it was. I never did, and that's what's amazing. Well, that's it's not so amazing. I get people in the office every day who come. I think I'm having a problem, and they never bother to close one eye. And right. if our viewers learn only one thing tonight, that is the value of closing one eye and then the other eye to see if everything looks intact, straight lines look straight, not wavy, and that you have vision. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, and, and it was amazing as to how my body just compensated for that when I didn't even test it that way mm -hmm. until I went to the doctor. Brain learned to ignore the bad image. Absolutely. So where did you go from there? Then the next day I immediately went to see an ophthalmologist 
who, uh, who ran some tests on me, dilated my eyes, and really at that point in time was not really sure because I had not had an MRI, uh, but was very concerned about ruling out various types of diagnosis that I could have from multiple sclerosis to optic neuropathy, optic neuritis. So your optic nerve was abnormal. Yes, the optic nerve was abnormal. The nerve that takes the vision back to the brain. Absolutely, that's what it so was. So who ultimately made the diagnosis? What type of doctor? From um, the ophthalmologist, I was then referred to a neuro-ophthalmologist, and he did an assessment, very extensive questioning of me, exam, and then ordered the MRI. And it was at that point, upon reviewing the MRI, that they realized that I had a tumor the size of a tennis ball on my left optic nerve. Wow. Did you have any headaches? No. I did not have any other signs and symptoms other than the blurring of vision, no headaches, no uh, seizures, no seeing of stars, nothing that you would have expected, mm -hmm. absolutely nothing other than that slight change in vision, which was very slow over the course of a year. So having received the diagnosis, now you have an MRI, who was it that ultimately helped you to deal with this problem? Then I was referred to a neurosurgeon. And what and did he have to say about it? He said, his first thing that he said when we met uh, him was, we have a very big problem here. And the tumor was too big to have radiation done to it. And the only option was surgery. How much detail did the doctor give you during your initial discussions? Did you want a lot of detail? Yes, I did want a lot of detail to a certain extent. Being a nurse, uh, it, certain things I knew without him even having to say them, but he did have to say them so that my husband and I both heard did them. Did you grasp the impact of this diagnosis? I did grasp it, but it was almost a surreal experience because at that time I felt as though there I was a nurse sitting there thinking, he's talking about me, and I'm used to having, being beside the physician, hearing him talk about somebody else, not me. Did you have to explain a lot of this to your husband? Yes, I did. I did explain a lot, and the physician took a great deal amount of time. He was very thorough. He did not rush us, and he answered all the questions that we had. How bad did he tell you it was? He basically said to me that even though radiation is not an option, that the surgery is the only way that they could remove the tumor, and that if I did not have surgery within one year, I could suffer paralysis, stroke, or ultimately the loss of my life. The loss of your life. Yes. So did you get the feeling that maybe you've been asleep all your life and not accomplished all of your dreams? Yes. And here you were facing your own mortality? Yes, very much so. And I really could not believe at that moment in time that, that I had this tumor and I was carrying it with me probably since I was a young girl. And how could this happen all of a sudden just from having blurred vision that it went to potentially the loss of life. Did they tell you that you had to get your affairs in order? Yes. He said to me, he said, Lisa, you must get your affairs in order. Uh, the criticality of the operation was also that the carotid artery was intertwined in the tumor. And he said, you know, we're looking at two grave things here. We're looking at that if you don't have surgery, what the outcome could be. He said, and also you have to recognize, and he goes, I know you're a nurse and you come from a family of nurses, but that we could also lose you on the table, you could suffer stroke as a result of the surgery. It, that was a powerful message. How do you yes. even begin to get your affairs in order? Where do you start? You've got a 13-year-old daughter, you've got a husband. You must have been very concerned about them. I was. I, I immediately went to focus on them. What do I do for them? How do I help them? Um, what does this mean for them? And what do I need to do to make sure that they're okay? That was my first inclination. And my other question was immediately shortly there in there was, is there a genetic link to the tumors? Because immediately I went to my daughter. Well, were you we able to be strong? You're used to being in charge. You're obviously a supervisor type of nurse. You're a director. You're not just taking orders from others. Were you at this point able to take charge of your own health? I, I was able to take charge of my own health. Um, at the moment in time when we were receiving this very, very frightening and devastating news, I, I found myself that I really couldn't even look at my husband because I was so overwhelmed and, and just really trying to take it all in in the moment to process what this really meant. 
and it's still, you know, a few years later, it still does take me back in time when I think about what I felt and really what did I go through and how did I get through it? Well, doctors can tell you all about the technical aspects. We're going to cut here, we're going to radiate here, we're going to give you chemotherapy, but how do you begin to prioritize with this limited amount of time that you have exactly all that you need to have done? How did you do that? Well, let me tell you, with my, the love and support of my husband, my parents, my family, my friends, also my faith, and really just focusing on them. And one of the things that somebody very near and dear to me, a friend had told me, was that I really didn't get caught up in the why me. I was so focused and worried about everybody else and making sure that they were in order, that my daughter was gonna be okay. How do I tell her something like this and prepare her as a 13 year old in a very simplistic way and yet I still want her to have hope and keep my hope alive and the strength that I have that I am going to return Did home. you think it was important that she know exactly what was going on? Yes, to a certain extent on a very simplistic level, I did think it was important because if something did tragically happen, in the OR, I didn't want to have not have been honest with her on the front end of it. But it was a very fine line to walk because again, she was 13 years old at the time and I really wanted to make sure she had a basic understanding but that she could feel the strength and the belief and faith I had that I was going to get through this. As at times, quietly, I may have had my doubts, but I never really wanted to convey that to anybody else because I really wanted to be strong for them and, and have them feel the vibe that I was trying to exude to all of them. How did she take the news? She was very overwhelmed at first, but she was strong. She asked questions, uh, very simplistic questions. And one of the things I, sh I, I you know, shared with my neurosurgeon was that being a nurse, but Yes, that's what I am from a professional perspective, but I'm a mom first. So please help me in guiding her as her mother in that I give her enough information, but I don't overwhelm her. And I really think that is something that you kind of have to touch and feel. When I felt she didn't want to talk about it anymore or she had had enough, then we stopped. And she had some private conversations with her dad, and you know he was just amazing. And I think that that really was very, very helpful as well. And while you may not have asked, why me, mm -hmm. you must admit that our hold on life is sometimes very tenuous, even when you think you have the world by, its, by the tail and you're just going full force, things do happen and we have to reach inside and find that amazing inner strength and resilience. And you seem to exemplify this. Where did you find it? You know, it's amazing. If somebody were to have told me that this was going to happen and would have said, you know, hypothetically, Lisa, how would you handle it? I don't know that I would have known that I would have handled it this way. And when I look back on it, I'm really amazed at myself. I really dug deep down. I really relied on my faith, my family, my friends, the love and support, and the magnificence of my healthcare team. And until you're really in those shoes, you sometimes don't really know that inner strength that you really have until you're put to the test. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I found that I don't know that I would have known I would have handled it that way until I actually was in it. But those are all the key components. And really saying, you know, I still have so much life yet to live, so much to do. I'm going to fight this all the way and give it everything I have. Mm -hmm. What were your greatest fears? The fear of dying, the fear of pain you were going to go through, the fear of paralysis. What, what was your greatest fear as you were working through all of this? I think my greatest fear was probably not, you know, I, not coming out of it, not, not beating it. But what I did find myself doing, as soon as that thought would come into my mind, I immediately stopped and said, oh no, this, this is not going to be where you go, Lisa. This is going to be something you are going to beat and you are going to take everything you have to be positive. One of my physicians had said to me, you know, when you're the patient and you're faced with whatever diagnosis you're faced with, you're the core and you set the tone for everybody and how they feel around you. And so I felt by trying to be positive myself that hopefully that would exude pos positive feelings in others that were with me, my family and friends, and would hopefully take some of that tension off. But again, we all had our quiet moments when maybe you know you just did question it and you really wondered what, what the outcome was gonna be. But I tried not to let myself go there. Well, that's very good advice. Remain positive and the, the presence of your positiveness just is contagious and spreads to others. It's a source of great strength. We're going to find out 
more about Lisa's experience and the advice that she has with us, for us as we all deal with these situations from time to time. Please stay tuned. Back to Medically Speaking, I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, interviewing Lisa McDermott, who comes to us tonight not as a nurse or healthcare administrator, which is a part of her other life, but rather as a patient describing her experiences with a large brain tumor that may have been fatal, but fortunately, she has gotten a second chance at life. Well, Lisa, how do you live fully in the shadow of mortal time? What are your priorities? What did you think you had to accomplish before maybe the inevitable would happen? Well, in the short period of time was really making sure that my husband and my daughter were taken care of and that they knew how much I loved them. And, and given the second chance, as you said, really trying to be a better mom, a better wife, a better daughter, and looking at it differently than I ever thought I would, um, looking through the eyes of somebody that was facing possibly the loss of life, and really digging down deep and really realizing what's really important in life. Because as we all know, it could be gone in a second. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you consider yourself a religious person or a spiritual person? Do you consider those both to be the same? Uh, I am a religious person and also spiritual, but they can actually be different. Um, I think it's what you dig down deep within yourself, what your faith is, what you hold on to, and what you look to that gives you that inner strength. And I'm very blessed and very fortunate that I do have that and that that's very much rooted in, in my upbringing and I try to pass that on to my family as well. But that was one of the sources of my greatest strength in really being able to handle this and be positive in what I was facing. It's an interesting thing. Religion would teach us that we should not fear death. Mm -hmm. And yet we all rather avoid the subject. We kick the bucket. We don't really die. We just kick the bucket. Mm -hmm. And some of these other little expressions that are used to describe death, mm -hmm. uh, we really don't welcome discussion about it. Right. It, it's interesting because when you go through something like this and you're facing it, you really almost have to come to an inner peace and an inner calmness within yourself. And it forces you to ask some tough questions and do a lot of self-reflection. And in doing that with the support, as I said, of my family, my friends, and, and my faith, it, it wasn't always easy to do that, but that's how I tried to ready myself if I felt that time was going to be much quicker than I had ever expected. You had your healthcare team around you, you had your family, your friends surrounded by others, yet did you at all feel a little alone with this diagnosis? There were times, yes, I did, because it was hard to always articulate what I was feeling, and by me saying it, it made it true. So really, what I found myself doing is kind of censoring what I felt and what I was willing to share. And sometimes I kept things close to my chest because it wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to put out there for others to worry about. I would say to myself, I'll worry about that. And I may not have really talked about that because it is something that unless you're in those shoes, you can't really understand it 100%. Mm -hmm. And it's often hard to articulate it as well when you are going through it. Mm -hmm. Do you think, or let's put it this way, did you maintain hope throughout this whole experience that things would be okay? And then as the second part, is it important to maintain hope? Yes, I did maintain hope. When I went into the OR, I had a tremendous aura overcome me. I really felt like when they wheeled me in there at that moment, it was the strangest feeling, not something that I was looking for, not something that I expected. 
but I was open to receive whatever the feelings would be, and that's what overcame me, that I knew deep down inside I was going to be okay, and I really tried to keep that positive. And yes, it definitely does make an impact, I think, on your recovery when you're positive and you seek the challenges that you have to overcome because it gives you an opportunity to see where you were, where you are today, and where you hope to be tomorrow in your recovery. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind that you are the core when you're the patient, but that everybody around you is processing it as well. And mm -hmm. de depending on how they have the relationship with you or how they're involved with you, out of respect to them, it also helps them, I think, to be positive as well mm -hmm. when they know that you're giving it everything you have in a positive framework. Now, what do you think a patient should expect from their health care team as the patient is trying to navigate through this very difficult time? I think really the main thing is sharing information from the health care provider to the patient and the family. The patient and the family should be treated as a unit and that the patient and the family member goes together to the doctor's office or to their appointments and has their questions written down so that they can remember what they need to ask the physician because there's a wealth of information. So really it's a collaborative effort that the patient and the family members mm -hmm. will rally together to support one another and to let the physician know what they need from the physician. And that way the physician can give them, as you said earlier, all the technical aspects, but it's that bedside manner, it's that close relationship, it's the kindness, it's the gentle eyes, it's really the supportive nature that really nourishes a relationship when you're going through something so traumatic, and that's really what you want to expect. You want the best of the best clinically, but you also want that other piece of it, so you have that trust. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to have all of that in my healthcare team. Mm -hmm. So they met your expectations? Yes, they did. Wow. Did you ever seek any kind of professional counseling or any kind of psychological services to help you through this most difficult time? No, I really didn't. Uh, the support and love, as I said, of my family, my friends, and um, and really my faith, and, and really having that opportunity to talk with people about different aspects of it um, really has been uh, you know, so supportive of, of me and has allowed me to grow and, and move through this journey as I have been. Mm -hmm. Did you find, as you were navigating through this journey, that you were able to maintain your dignity at all times? Yes, I would say yes, I would for the most part. But there are many things that I learned being a patient that we take for granted in life. Things that are so simple that you just get up and you get dressed or you take a shower or you brush your teeth. and. When I wasn't able to do that completely independently and the simplest daily tasks became very much a big deal, it was really an aha moment for me. And I really learned to appreciate what it takes for us to do those simple things and to celebrate, hey, I went up and down the steps by myself today, or mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, make lunch and, 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 you know, walk my daughter to school, those certain things, it really made me do a lot of self-reflecting, not only as a mom and as a wife and as a daughter, but also as a nurse. Someone once said there's a little bit of heaven even in a disaster area. So you have ultimately survived this nightmare. Were there any positives or benefits in going through this experience? I, I think it's given me a newfound perspective on life. Um, as I said, I really would not want anybody to have to go through something like this. But going through this has really taught me a lot of things. And one of the main things is, is that you can't always control what happens to you in your life, but you can control what you do with what you've been given. And one of the greatest gifts I've been given in this is my, is my life. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I really have an opportunity to share my story with others. Mm -hmm. You wake up in the morning, as you always have. Are there things now that you do differently? I take a moment and enjoy simple things in life. One of the things that I often share with people as I've moved through my journey and will continue to is just remember each and every day to take a moment and enjoy the simple things in life, whether it's somebody giving you a smile or their gentle eyes or the breeze blowing through your hair, because life is really short. And it's when you take that moment and you really enjoy it that you have the greatest sense of inner peace and calmness and what a true blessing that is. Are there any special indulgences that you have now that you maybe before just didn't take out time to do or just didn't do? 
I think uh, doing more writing. I've, I've written a journal and um, I'm looking to hopefully one day have that published and really write about this and, and really take the time to do that. Uh, that's a gift to myself and, and to hopefully to my family and friends and to those that will read it so that I don't ever forget what I've learned about this journey and what it has taught me along the way. And, and really, again, just enjoying simple things. I love chocolate, saying it's okay to eat the chocolate, not worrying so much about that. And yet, remembering to thank people and share the good and the positive and let the people know the difference they make in my life now, you know, because that's such a priceless gift that we can give to others. Mm -hmm. So you're sharing your story, one of life's darkest moments for you. Um, and fortunately for you, death was not the end of, how, how did that saying go, that uh, death ends a life, not a relationship. You didn't have to live that one fortunately, but you choose to share this story, the story of courage, the story of uh, tremendous soul-searching, suffering with us. Why do you choose to relive it? Because you told me it's not always easy for you to tell the story. You know, as I said earlier, I never asked, why me? Why was I diagnosed with a brain tumor? But now I do ask the question, why did I survive when so many have lost the battle? And so I have promised myself that I want to go out there and give hope and inspiration to others by the journey that I have traveled. And the reality is, is that we really all have a story to tell. And when you tell it from deep within your heart, people will listen, they will feel it, and most importantly, they will remember it. And I hope that I give each and every person that hears my story a little gemstone or a little rose petal to hold on to and whatever they're dealing with their life, that it can make a difference for if them. If any of our viewers have a close friend who is struggling with a problem such as yours or a member of their family, what can they best do to help? They can let that person know they're there in whatever way it may be. Sometimes it could be you're sitting there with them quietly. Maybe you're talking to them. Maybe you're asking them to take a stroll, putting some music on, just simply letting them know that you are there for them in whatever way they need you, that you would be there for them. Now you have a very special plaque in your home. If I can just quote it, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning how to dance in the rain. What does it mean to you? When we bought that plaque, we bought it back in 2009, and I was diagnosed and had my surgery in 2011. And I love poetry, and I love to write poetry, and we just picked that up because I just thought it was great. You know, I just thought, well, you know, you have trying times in your life, and you learn to move through them, and you make the most of it. But when I went through all of this, it became so much more powerful. And really, my family and I really did have a storm to deal with. I even joke sometimes, I say we had the thunder and the lightning and the, a lot of challenges. But you know, we really learned to be positive and we really learned to make it through. And it wasn't always easy, but what we have learned about ourselves and how our family has become stronger for the journey and as we continue to walk the journey, it is a priceless gift. And it is just something that we are thankful for each and every day. And we really did learn how to dance in the rain. We really did. Well, Lisa, it is a remarkable story, and you come to us with great bravery, sensitivity, inspiration for all of us, and all of us should appreciate each and every day and each and every moment that we have because it is most precious. I do hope that you write your book because I think it will continue to spread your words, your wisdom, and be of benefit to many. So thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for sharing your message. This has been Medically Speaking. It's sponsored by York County Medical Society and York County Medical Foundation. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, ophthalmologist and retinal surgeon, wishing you good health, happiness, and a great week. We'll see you soon.